So we welcome you once again to First Baptist Church Online Bible Studies, and we've uh, finished out our last series, and we're starting a new series uh, today on the, the great doctrines of the Bible. Uh, we'll go through and look at the different major sections of theology, and we're going to start with the matter of the scriptures referred to by the theologians as bibliology or the study of the Bible. Then we'll go into theology, Christology, pneumatology, so forth. But we want to do this in a very uh, clear and a very simple, straightforward fashion. I've taught this in years past uh, in the church setting as well as in the college setting and I re jokingly refer to my notes that I use at church as my Archie Bunker notes. And if Archie Bunker can understand it, then hopefully all the rest of us can. But I hope that you will follow with your Bible, and if you'd like copies of these notes, just contact us here at First Baptist Church here in Dayton, Tennessee, and we'll be glad to mail them to you. And so as we start, let's open with prayer. Father, you give us your mind and your understanding as we seek to understand these great truths that relate to our faith. Lord, we want to know you in the right way and follow you and have our lives changed and be able to glorify you in all that we do. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. The subject of the scriptures, the subject of the Bible. Every time I think of this subject, my thoughts go to those various uh, post-resurrection appearances of our Lord after uh, he had risen from the dead and he appeared to a number of people. So the reality of his resurrection is with, without question. But one of these stories is in Luke 24 where he appeared to two disciples uh, on the road back to uh, the town of, of Emmaus, they were very troubled uh, of, of what all has happened. They, they don't know yet about the resurrection. And Jesus encountered them and walked with them, and they told him what happened. And the scriptures tell us that uh, Jesus opened the scriptures. He said, ought not the... Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded or he opened up and explained to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then at that point, uh, they had reached the little village of Emmaus and Jesus, it looked like he was going to go on. They had encouraged him to stay and spend the night with them because of the distance that they, he might be traveling. And it says when they were eating that night and Jesus broke the bread and prayed, their eyes were opened and they realized it was Jesus himself. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? And every time I read this, I think, oh God, I want you to burn my heart with spiritual truth. I want the doctrines, the teachings of the scriptures to change me. And what happened to these two believers on the road to Emmaus ought to be our desire that God's word and this truth that Jesus explained concerning the coming of the Christ and his suffering and dying and raising, being raised from the dead was all in Scripture. This kind of truth should have just burned them and excited them. And I want that to be my experience. I want it to be your experience. So we're going to start with this subject of the Bible itself and why we should recognize the Bible is truly an inspired or God-given record of himself that we might know the truth, 
we might be free from our sin and live the life that God wants us to live. We have to recognize that in, in the very beginning, it was all verbal. Then God gave the Ten Commandments. And then after the establishment of the, of the Jewish nation, uh, Moses wrote the, the other books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, explaining the law and how they're to worship, their history, and the law given again for that second generation. So the Jewish people had a body of truth they referred to as the Mosaic Law in God's Word. And this was written, and then God raised up men to fulfill this record as Scripture was being fulfilled. And then the completion of the Old Testament, Jesus coming, the four apostles writing, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, helping us have the story of Christ, and then the book of Acts written by Luke, and then the letters of Paul and Peter written, completing the Bible. But I, I recognize people don't acknowledge this as a divine book, a divine record that has been given to us that we might know God in a real way. This is his love letter to us. And I ask you, are you reading God's love letter? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and he has given us this wonderful record. It's been less than, bar well, barely 500 years that mankind has had a printed copy of God's word. For centuries it was hand copied, and it was only in the churches or in the synagogues that there was a record of God. God's record or a record of God's revelation to mankind. And so we're asking the question today, is the Bible really inspired? And the answer is yes. We have internal evidence. We have external evidence. We have experiential evidence. And we're going to walk through this in several studies, not just one, for you to see this. And I'd love for you to have a copy of of the notes uh, that would help you because even a casual reader of the Bible soon recognizes that they're, the fact that they are reading a most unusual book. It covers thousands of years of human history by more than 40 authors and it is not just a collection of writings but it is one book of amazing continuity. We need to look at some general terms right off. We use the English word Bible. It comes from a Greek word, biblos, uh, which just simply means a book or a scroll. This word is found in the Bible. In fact, when Jesus went into the synagogue uh, as an adult and uh, he had been away and he was honored and they gave him the scroll to read that day, and he opened it to the book of Isaiah and read a portion about him himself. And it says that he opened the scroll or the book, the Biblos. Uh, another word that is used is the word scripture, which is the Greek word graphe, meaning sacred books of writings, both of the Old and the New Testament. And that's the way it, that word is used throughout our Bible. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, the apostle uh, Paul put it this way when he wrote to Timothy. He said, From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which were able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. For all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the mind of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly or completely furnished unto all good works. So the purpose of God's word is to give us doctrine. And that word means teaching. We refer to it as theology, the study of God. And our 
source is the scriptures, the graphe. And another phrase that is used is the phrase, the word of God. Uh, this phrase denotes the origin of these sacred writings. In John 10, 35, Jesus was being challenged uh, because he claimed to be the son of God. And uh, Jesus answered the Pharisees and said, is it not written in your law? I say you're God's. And he quoted from Psalms 82, where the psalmist is rebuking the leaders who are not judging righteous judgment. Uh, they knew the truth, but they were not following the truth. They set themselves up as gods. They should have been that person who possessed the truth and judged righteous judgment. And so when Jesus was judging righteous judgment, they, they couldn't handle it. And uh, so Jesus quoted that passage of scripture in Psalms 82. And he said, if he, the writer, called them gods uh, unto whom the word of God came and the scriptures cannot be broken, and he goes on and said, you ought to be accepting me. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not doing what they did. And he referred to divine revelation as God's word or scripture. So whether we refer to the Bible as the Bible or as scripture or as God's word or God's truth, we're all referring to this written revelation that we have. The internal evidence is amazing. And there are so many scriptures that we could read. There are hundreds of passages that declare or assume the Bible to be the word of God. From the very beginning uh, in Moses' writings, in Deuteronomy 6, in uh, Psalms chapter 1, the psalmist opens that great book of songs. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Oh yes, he loved God's truth. Uh, Psalms 119 is a whole large section of the Bible that is all about the Bible itself. Of a uh, hundred and 60, 70 verses that are in that chapter, only two of them do not mention the Word of God. It's constantly referring to the greatness and the importance of God's truth. Yes, th this is so, so very critical. The writer of Hebrews said, the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing sunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It's a discerner. In other words, it's capable of judging the thoughts and intents of our heart. God's Word. What a powerful thing. Uh, Psalms, or excuse me, uh, in uh, Proverbs, we're told about the fact that the Scriptures are pure and we are to recognize that every word of God is pure and God is a shield to them that put their trust in him and add thou not unto his words lest he reprove thee and you be found a liar no God's word is pure it's clean it's straight it will guide you in to all of the right ways of life. And I can go on and on and read so many scriptures. Isaiah the prophet referred uh, to the Bible and God's truth. He said, for as the rain comes down from uh, and the snow from heaven and returns not uh, thither and waters the earth and brings forth and buds that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word go forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void or empty, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. God's word will do its work. The question is, will you expose yourself to it? 
Will you use it in your life? Will you let be God be God in your life? And will you let God's word be the guide of your life? It'll change you. No question about it. There is so much. I can go on and on and read so many of these scriptures. In Colossians 3.16, Paul said, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Let spiritual truth be a total part of your life. You cannot live a full and successful life without spiritual truth ministering to the spiritual needs of your life. Food for the physical, exercise for the physical, reading and studying for the mental part of your life, interacting with people for the social part of your life. But your spiritual life has to be fed by God's Word. It's alive. It's powerful. It'll change you. Oh, if people would only latch on to that truth. I could take another hour or two hours and tell you stories of people that I have known, I have shared God's Word with them, God's Word changed their life. I'm talking about people who couldn't read. I'm talking about people who were alcoholics. I'm talking about people whose lives were a disaster. God came in and totally changed them. And I have seen that happen over decades of time. Not just one isolated instance. Again and again of almost 60 years of active ministering of God's Word. Yes, I can tell you a few stories. God's Word works in the lives of people. And that's why when we say internal evidence, we mean God's Word declares itself to be exactly what it is. And we need to believe it. It's, it's there. The question is, do you believe it? You have to react to it. God is there. The truth is there. The food is on the table. You can come and eat or you can starve to death at the side of a table loaded with wonderful food. And there are many people starving spiritually because they will not take hold of the very bread of life. Yes, there's so much. There's external evidence. And let me just read a few of these things to you that you can get hold of this truth. As I said before, 40 men wrote 66 books over a period of 1,400 years. And yet we have a unit. We have a consistent book with a central theme that runs to it. We can't get two people in the same generation to write something that's consistent, much less 40 men over 1,400 years. Only God could do that. It was written by kings and peasants and philosophers, fishermen, physicians, statesmen, scholars, poets, farmers, living in different cultures, living in different times, in different situations, and yet they wrote a harmonious book. The Bible has accurate historical facts and sequence and a clear doctrinal progression. Yes, every place where the Bible speaks historically of nations and people and languages, it has been accurate and it is yet to be corrected. It it has fulfilled prophecy which was without dispute. What the Bible in the Old Testament where Daniel prophesied the four kingdoms that were going to come in the Middle East and in the Mediterranean, and we had the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman Empire just as the book of Daniel predicted. What are you going to do with that? If you reject it, you're going to suffer a loss. If you accept it, God will change you. We have the extent of biblical revelation. God spoke. The Bible begins with the beginning of time, man's creation, the fall and development, 
even man's final destiny in the book of Revelation. Although it was written centuries ago, it has never been contradicted. It has never contradicted a modern discovery. All that science has come forth with, where the Bible has spoken, it has been accurate. The Bible is not a science book, it's not a medical book, but where it speaks, it's true. For years, medical people did not know the life was in the blood. Even as late as the time of the death of Abraham Lincoln, they were draining blood out of him rather than giving him blood. But today we know had he gotten blood transfusions and they could have operated, maybe they could have saved his life. But the Bible said the life of all flesh is in the blood from the earliest of times. See, we don't always believe or understand what we read. We have the influence and publication of Scripture. The Bible is the most preserved and copied of all the ancient documents. It was the first book to be printed. Yes, Gutenberg's uh, movable, movable type press, the first thing that was printed was the Bible. First to be printed. No book has been printed in more languages or been the bestseller more years than the Bible. The Bible continues to be the bestseller of books worldwide. No question about it. Take all the other religions and put them in one pile. You don't match what we have with the scriptures and Christianity. Now, when you start pitting other world religions against Christianity, it's apples and oranges. Christianity is here. The world religions are way down here when you start uh, making quantitative or qualitative analysis or comparison. The Bible possesses the highest level of morality and virtue of any so-called religious book. Nothing matches the scriptures. The Bible is literature. The supremacy of the Bible in literature is without question. Yes, that's right. Even in the literary category. It's graphic history. It's detailed prophecy, it's beautiful poetry, it's drama, it's love stories, the recording of national wars, speculations of human reason over the finality of God's revelation. It's all there. My friend, you need to study the Word of God. You do not realize what a book you have that you can possess and hold in your hands. The supernatural character of the Bible is obvious to any serious reader. It presents the unknown as freely as the known. Eternity past, eternity future, and the nature and works of God for Israel and for the church are all stated with accuracy and finality. No other book even attempts to do what the Bible has done and has stood the test of time. I took time to write this and to write it in the most concise manner that I could so that I could present it to you as a challenge. This isn't all the answers. I have just skimmed the surface. But you need to recognize this is an awesome book and it's worthy of the time that you would devote to it to glean the great truths of it and be changed and be a better person, a different person, a quality person, a life-changing person. Yes, supernatural in character. But also it has unprejudiced authority. Yes, the Bible speaks with authority. When God says it, that settles it. Years ago, I heard the expression, Oh, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, whether you believe it or you don't believe it, God's word is settled. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in the heavens. A clear statement coming right out of the Bible. God's word is settled. It's here. God's truth will endure for all generations. This is what we're told in Scripture. 
a part of that abundance of internal evidence. And I just read to you some things concerning the world itself as external evidence. A pastor down in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Dr. G. James Kennedy, wrote a book, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? And in this book, he traces the impact of Christianity in the world. He says, if you ever considered the impact of Christ uh, on world history, on the value of human life, what Christianity has contributed to helping the poor, uh, con his contribution to education, Christianity's impact on the very founding of America, uh, civil liberties, Christianity's impact on science, economics, on the family, on health, education. Christianity has impacted morality the world over, slavery and things of that nature. It was Christianity, not other world religions that made the difference, Christianity. And then the matter of arts and music and so on. What a book that Dr. Kennedy put together of the external evidence. We've looked at internal evidence, external evidence, but the last point is the experiential. Have you put God's word to the test? If you will come to God and acknowledge that his son is the savior of the world and that you are a sinner, and you need to be changed. You need new life in you. You need a clear purpose for living. You need assurance that eternity is secure, that heaven is your home. You find that when you come and say, oh God, I'm a sinner. And at this moment, I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my savior. You enter into the family of God. Then you get into his book and you begin to read and study. You learn to read the scriptures. You learn to pray. You find truth. You apply it to your life. And as you are experiencing change, you then share it with other people. Share it with others. And you see God work in their life and it strengthens you. And so there is a life, an entire life of growth. This is what we do. And all of this constitutes external evidence. Internal evidence, what the Bible says about itself. External evidence, the world and the impact of the Bible on the entire world. But people don't want to accept that. And some have never heard it. But my friend, the internal and external evidence is overwhelming. If you will just have an open mind to read it and think about what it means. But last of all, this unprejudiced authority. The Bible unhesitatingly records the sin and weakness of the best of men, warns those who rely upon their own virtues. It records God's critical message to all mankind, and without Him, they're doomed. The changed lives of the followers of Jesus Christ and this biblical revelation is living proof of its authenticity and its power. And I challenge you today, look into your own heart. Are you right with God? Are you at peace? If you died today, if you died while listening to this very broadcast, would you go to heaven or would you end up in eternal hell? You can have the answers if you go to God's book the living word. And when you do, you will find the living Savior, Jesus Christ, and he'll change you and give you new life. Oh, my friend, turn to God's word today and accept it. God bless you.